the, today I want to start off with, a, I think it's a, a good illustration, somebody that we can all identify with. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, college football, and, and even if you're not, you'll know, you'll know this fella, Tim Tebow. All right, Tim Tebow, everybody know who that is? Y'all heard of him? He's kind of, kind of popular. Uh, he's the Heisman Trophy uh, winning quarterback from the Florida Gators. Don't start booing and hissing. Right, we know we're not real big on, on Gators in this part of the country, but uh, he was a Heisman Trophy winner. He dr was drafted by the Broncos and then was traded to the Jets, and now he's in broadcasting. So his career in the NFL didn't last very long. He kind of came and went, and uh, he was extremely popular, and he was polarizing. Either, either you loved him or you hated him. There was really no middle ground. I mean, he had everything going for him. He's good looking, right? He's a handsome man. He's a winner, and he was... For us, the thing that stood out the most is very outspoken about his love for Jesus, right? If you know, even in the, the picture here, he would wear the eye black patches under his eyes, and, and it was common for him to have John 3.16 or other verses there, and that drew much attention, and people would take notice of those things. And by him wearing John 3.16, that would have people have interest. And what does that mean? And in, in, in the 2009 National Championship game, uh, he wore the, the eye black with the John 3.16 on it, and he almost broke Google. Ninety million people went to Google to see what John 3.16 was. So 90 million people were exposed to that verse. Ninety million people were exposed to the gospel in some way, shape, or form. And then also later in his NFL career in the 2012 in the AFC Wild Card Playoff game, uh, he threw for 316 yards, exactly, with an average of 31.6 yards per completion now coincidence i don't know i mean it's pretty it's a pretty sorry uh completion average you only completed 10 passes right of the, in a whole game but it's 31.6 and so his uh his fame and his love for jesus the the commentators the sports announcers automatically drew a comparison to hit to john 316 and put it all together so once again the internet was a buzz and, and google just about crash with people seeking to understand what John 3.16 was all about. So that's all good. That's wonderful. Tebow did wonderful with that. But he did a disservice to Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13 just turned into some type of a, a motivational tagline, a, a, a something to kind of get him pumped up for the game by claiming that this verse was was the victory, you know, a victory over his opposing team because he said that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right, that's how he used it. So that, that just comes to, to me, a natural question is, what if you're playing a game against another Christian quarterback? And he also claims Philippians 4.13. Who's going to win? Right? That can't be what it's about. That can't be what it's about. It can't just be a tagline of, about claiming your victory and giving yourself some type of a pep talk before you set out for, to, to serve God or to do some great thing. That's not what it's about, and we're going to find out today. That's not what Paul meant. This is where our first lesson of this morning, before we even get to the sermon, context matters. Context matters when you're reading scriptures. Context means seeing the big picture of the passages. It's not just isolating one verse and ignoring everything else. We get in trouble when we do that. We have to be careful to read the entire passage. This keeps us from missing scripture, misusing scripture to make it say something that's not intended to say. That's why for myself, I've determined that whenever I typically preach a passage, I mean, I know at Christmas I did just John 3.16, but typically I'm going to preach a whole passage. I'm going to do three or four verses or more to build the context. I think it's important for us to have the understanding, the full understanding of a passage in its context. And so this morning, we're going to look at 413, but in its proper context, in its proper context. We'll see it's more than being, it's more about being than doing. It's more about being than doing, okay? So just a little bit of background uh, for our passage this morning. I'd like to, to give some background. Uh, Philippians is one of Paul's uh, prison epistles because he found himself in, in prison quite often. If you are familiar with Paul, it's part of... Uh, the group of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, uh, Philemon is known as the prison epistles. And during the time he wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was being detained in Rome for approximately two years while he was awaiting trial to see Caesar uh, himself. He uh, 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 made an appeal to be seen by him as a Roman citizen. And so 
uh, little did he know, or maybe he did know, uh, that he was going to gain a, a, a ear with Caesar. And if he could he- gain an ear with Caesar to hear his appeal, and Caesar would, would, would bow the knee or be exposed to the gospel, then, then the gospel would become uh, widespread, and, and, and his influence over all of Rome would be tremendous. And that was what God had in store for this. Now, this imprisonment was not the, the, what we think of the Mamertine prison at, at, at the end of Paul's life. This was more of a house arrest where he would be accompanied to or, or maybe even chained to some uh, Roman soldiers. And he would have some limited uh, movement and able to move about some. But he was confined, but he was not free. So, therefore, he was indeed a prisoner of Rome for this time. But he didn't, he didn't spend it whining and complaining and, and woe is me and, and all those things. He t- made good use of his time. He wrote letters. He broke out his pen and paper and, and got to work and sending encouragement to the, the churches that he had already founded. Because Paul often found himself in difficult situations. He understood what it meant to suffer for the sake of the gospel. He got it. He gave us his resume of suffering in 2 Corinthians eleven, twenty-two to 30. In 2 Corinthians, he was defending himself against allegations that were being made by his Jewish opponents, the, the ones known as Judaizers. He says, starting in verse 22, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. And in 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant in stripes, above measures, in prisons, more frequently in deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among frost brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst and fastings, often. In cold and nakedness, besides the other things. Right? He, gets, he almost gets wore out. He just gives just a, a, a little add on there. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. And then here's the key. 29. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. And 30, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. Paul was a great example of quite exhausting contentment. A great example for us. Let's take a look at our passage. Philippians 4, verse 11 to 13. Paul says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. And here's our key verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, as we gather this morning. Uh, Lord, open our uh, mind, open our hearts to understand this passage. Father, help us to, to get a hold of this truth. Father, help us to be content with the life that you have given us. Help us to be content with your provision for us, Father, that you are good. We can trust you, Father, and anything you lead us to do that you will provide for us to be able to accomplish all that you would have us to do. Father, thank you for the ones that are here this morning, God. I, I pray that you would just honor of their time, Father, that they would leave this place different because they've encountered you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Contentment. We're not big on contentment, I think, uh, as a a people these days. And so to start with that, what what does contentment mean? What does it mean to be content? And the, the, the dictionary says that contentment is defined as a state of being happy and satisfied. And if we're all honest, I think that we all struggle with being content. And in one way or another, uh, many of us grow content where we shouldn't be. All right? If we're honest, many of us grow content where we shouldn't be. And that would be in a spiritual sense or a physical sense, an emotional sense or a relational sense. All those that we, we should 
you, you know, we shouldn't be content in those areas. We shouldn't be satisfied in those areas. It's when we get lazy. We, we, we think our, our walk with Jesus is good enough, that the sanctification process is far enough, that we think we read our Bible enough, we think we understand Scripture enough, we think that we pray enough, we think we come to church enough, right? We grow content. We think we take good enough care of our bodies, right? Man, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Right? Eating right, exercising right, getting enough sleep. We think, we think all those things. We fool ourselves. We're content. That's enough, right? I walk. I walk from my car to my couch. That's enough exercise for a day. I'm content, right? I'm, I'm physically fit. I'm good enough. I can get back and forth. We think that we're sensitive to the needs of others, we think our relationships are good enough, that we've done enough work there, that you know, we've spent enough time with one another. So we get content in those areas. Laziness is typically why we become content in these areas, if we're honest. Laziness is what's behind it. All these ones I just mentioned, they never stop needing attention. Never. Right? Spiritually, emotionally, physically, always, always are going to need attention. And conversely, and sadly, and more disturbingly, many of us, struggle with being content in a few other areas, areas where we should be content, right, mainly materially or economically. We're not content there, are we? Seems like we're always wanting more. That, that bar keeps getting higher. We want to have more things, more stuff, you know, more this and more that. We like our toys. We like our comfort. So just a question is, like, how much is enough? How much is enough? When is enough going to be enough? How many more things do you need? Right? How, how, many, how much more do you possibly need? And then maybe another question is, why do you need more? Why do you need more? Do you, do you really need more income? Do you, you know, what, what's the purpose of it? Is it to help spread the gospel? Is it to help advance the kingdom? Or is it so you can buy more stuff? Right? Have nicer things. Your iPhone 5 isn't quite up to snuff, so you need an iPhone 6. Your 2014 vehicle isn't good enough, so you need a 2015 vehicle. And right when 16 rolls around, you'll get rid of that. Right? Always got to have something better, moving up the chain. Never content in these areas. Selfishness is typically why we struggle in those areas. Selfishness or self-centeredness. So let's take a look at it. I want us to leave this place today understanding what it means to have Christ-exalting contentment. I want you to leave this place wanting to be content in Christ and see the value of it. Your life will be changed if you get a hold of this truth this morning. So in our first thing we'll see in verse 11, that Christ-exalting contentment comes through remembering God's faithfulness. It comes through remembering God's faithfulness. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, you can read that and look at it, and I know sometimes, you know, we tend to do it, and and pastors are the worst at it. Paul was not poor-mouthing to get the Philippians to feel sorry for him. That's not what he was doing here at all. He wasn't poor-mouthing. He was wanting to lead them into freedom that he had found in being content in Christ. That's what he was trying to do. That was his purpose. Though he truly was in need. He really was in need. He was in prison. But that's not what he's talking about. He didn't let the, 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 his circumstances uh, you know, dictate who he was or her, his satisfaction in Christ. And Paul was always and forever teaching and modeling the life that Christ intended for us all. Always, even in a written form. So let's take a look at this, this whatever state that Paul is talking about here. This whatever state. Because the truth of the matter is there's no shortcut to learning to trust God for everything. There's no shortcut. Everybody could agree with that. There's no shortcut. I wish there was. I wish there was some type of pill or, or maybe something we could, we could ingest or some type of something we could add to the water that we drink that would help us to trust God for everything. But there's not. There's no shortcut. The trials of life is the classroom where these lessons are taught. When trials come, it's God shaping us, molding us, moving us to be more and more like his son. Sadly, many of us have to keep taking the same lesson over and over again. Right? Over and over again, we've got to go through that same trial until we finally get it right, until we finally learn what God would have us to learn through it. So we're thankful. We're thankful for the whatever state that we might find ourselves to be in. Now, early on in, in Paul's ministry, as he set out to... to on the mission that, that God has set apart for him, it's probably doubtful that, that he would be able to, uh, to say these things early on. He wouldn't be writing this type of thing early on. Right? He had to learn this the hard way. He had to 
shed a lot of tears along the way to be able to say these things. He had to bleed a lot of blood to be able to say these things. That he had to be abandoned and betrayed to be able to say these things that he's writing to the Philippians. Because if you think back to, to Paul's first being set apart in the book of Acts and being saved after he was blinded and, and God went and, and, and sought out Ananias to go to him to, to lay his hands on him, to welcome him in and to, that he would receive his sight back, he gave that commission to Paul. So Paul kind of knew what was laying out, coming for him, the life that he, what he set out before him. Uh, in Acts 9, 15 to 17, this is what God had told Ananias. He said, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name for gent before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And look at verse 16. How would you like this spoken over you? For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul understood. So how can we endure in the faith when life is hard? When our whatever state is painful and seemingly hopeless? First thing we do is we reflect on God's faithfulness to his people and his word. Right? Again, we always go back to that know the Bible, know your word. Look at see how God was faithful through his people throughout scripture. And also for us in our personal experience, we remember God's faithfulness towards us in the past. And, and Israel would often, in the Old Testament times, they would set up these monuments when God would do a great work for them, a great victory amongst the people. He would set up, the, the, they would set up an Ebenezer, what they'd call it. It's a stone of remembrance to remind them of God's faithfulness. And we have one example of this in 1 Samuel seven twelve. This is after the uh, Israelites had defeated the Philistines. Uh, the prophet Samuel, he said, then, in verse 12, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. This far the Lord has helped us. Israel understood when God had moved, they needed to remember what God had done because down the road when things are tough again, you look back and say, God provided for me then, and God will provide for me in the future. God was faithful then, and God will be faithful for me now. We need to be able to look back. Remembering God's past faithfulness allows us to be content in whatever state we find ourselves in. The second thing we see in our passage in verse 12, that Christ-exalting contentment is unaffected by life's circumstances. Christ-exalting contentment is unaffected by life's circumstances. It says, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Here's where Paul kind of separates uh, folks. This is where I think we, kind of, we can kind of draw out what I would call fair weather followers. Fair weather followers. You know what I'm talking about. And maybe you've been one in the past. When things are going well for us, we're content, right? God is blessing. Everything's wonderful. We're amening. We enjoy church, right? Everything's going wonderful. But when things are falling apart at the seams, we're far from being content. We're far from being content. We have no problem with God's goodness towards us, but we're not so big on God sending trials our way. Amen? All right? You want to bless? Bring it on, God. But as far as the trials and difficulties, eh, thanks but no thanks. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for us. It, and we, we need to have a balance. We need to have a, a, the right concept. And if a good example of this is that we can find a reading in the book of Job. And I don't know how many of y'all have spent time reading the book of Job. It's an a interesting read. It's a great read. It's an encouraging read. And basically what had happened is that we have Job as the, the character, the main focus of the, of the book and the name it's written after. And uh, what it was is the Satan had taken notice of Job because Job was a, was a man, a blessed man that, that God had shown favor on with, with prosperity and had many, uh, much livestock and a large family and all those things were signs of blessing and rightly so. And, and Satan said, sure, I bet he does love you. Look how good a life he has. Why would he not love you? You've done everything for him. And God saw through that. And he said, no, he, it's, he don't love me because I've given him stuff. He loves me because he loves me. He has a relationship with me, and, and, and Satan will, I, Satan says, I'll prove a point. I'll prove my point. Let me afflict him. Let me take away all this, and I'll show you that he don't love you. you he loves your stuff. Then God said, get after it. 
go ahead, knock yourself out, but don't kill him. Don't kill him. Do whatever you need to do, but I, 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 at the end of the day, I'll show you that that's not the way it is. And so he did. He, the, his, his children were killed. His livestock was gone, and he was afflicted greatly. And, and, and still, Job would not curse God. Still would not curse God. And so Satan said he backed up, and he made him another plan. So, okay, that was his stuff and his things. Now, I tell you what, God, you let me afflict his body, his personal body, I bet he'll sing a different song then. And God said, go ahead, knock yourself out, but, this, but don't kill him. You can't take his life. Do what you want, but you can't take his life. And so uh, as things couldn't get worse for Job, then lost his family, lost all of his, his means of income, all he had left was his wife and three worthless friends that, that gave him some horrible advice. And so he was sitting there and scraping at his sores with, with a piece of clay, and the dog would come and lick his wounds, and just about as bad as things could possibly get. And, you know, things couldn't get any, any worse and then his wife comes along. His wife give, come along, and she doesn't give up hope for him. She saw his sad estate, and she said this in Job 2, 9 and 10. She said, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, listen to this. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Mm. Rain or shine, good or bad, blessed be the name of the Lord is what Job said. Job got it. He understood what it meant to be content with whatever the Lord allowed. Paul got it as well. Paul understood it. He had experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. He had seasons of abundance and he had seasons of very little. Need I remind you where he's writing this from? Prison. In prison he was writing this letter from when he's saying these things. Because he understood what Christianity was all about. He understood that being a Christian meant to take up your cross. Take up your cross. Take up your cross daily. Paul knew what he had signed up for. He had read the fine print, if you will. I think sometimes we shortchange people by not explaining to them exactly what being a Christian means. John MacArthur had this to say about Paul. He said that Paul was no ivory tower theologian. He had lived and ministered in the trenches. His life was not exactly a testimonial for the prosperity gospel. Right? He knew what he was talking about. He had bled. He had ached. He had hurt. He had mourned. He had wept. Because we get things turned around in this life. We, we think the blessings of, of, of following Christ are the blessings in the here and now. And that's just simply not true. The blessing of following Jesus is primarily after this life. The, bre- the blessing of, of being a Christ follower, the, the blessings that we'll receive is mainly after this life ends in eternity with him. Paul penned in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, he said this, talking about, it's funny when pa- Paul's on writing this and he says in verse 17, for our light affliction, right? our light affliction, the things that Paul had suffered, the things that we suffer, when we, we, we find out we have stage 3 cancer, stage 4 cancer, we have, we have you know, different things come against us. And Paul would remind us to think of it in the eternity, the, the big picture. This time we have here on earth, whatever comes our way, to think of it that way. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, he says, in the big picture, in an eternal scheme of things, only a moment. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know what our life is about? This life is all about whatever time that God grants us, that gives us. This life is about wringing ourselves out for the sake of the gospel. That's what this life is all about. It's about wringing ourselves out for the gospel. It's not about collecting toys. Right? This, this ain't just a, the, a leisure trip. This ain't just a, a skip through the daisies. Right? That Yeah, sure, God in, 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 in wants us to enjoy life and, 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 and soak up all of the goodness that he gives, he blesses us with. But sometimes we get distracted. The main thing is about the gospel, advancing the gospel. That's what life's all about. Making disciples of all nations. That's what life's all about. That's what it's supposed to be about. And suffering will come. 
And I love when I read through the Gospels and I see Jesus and his account, and it's, it's so different the way we evangelize and the way that we, we kind of portray Jesus and we, the way we try to sell Christianity, if you, we will, we kind of shortchange people with the gospel and what it means. Jesus wasn't so, so soft-spoken. He would be blunt. He would be clear about uh, what it meant to follow him, but all the would-be disciples. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 24, and listen to this. Does this sound like he's trying to soft-sell or trying to hide what it means to be a follower? He was straight up. He was trying to thin the herd a bit. He said, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desire, desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Who's in? Huh? Line up. Who's in? Who's on board? No takers? Good. That's what he would say. I'd rather you not say yes and then down the road falter. The life of following Christ is the life of sacrifice. Taking up your cross daily means dying to yourself daily. Surrendering your whole life to him. That's what it means. It's not just coming to church. It's not just singing songs. It's not just stuffing a check in the envelope. Right? It's far more than that. Far more than that. We need to be up front with people. We're not here. I'm not here to sell fire insurance. Right? That's not, that's not what I'm here for. To follow Christ is to, to, to give your life to him wholly, fully. It's to present a gospel that would have people to give their lives over fully to Jesus. It's a life of submission to his authority. It's a life of sacrifice, whatever it takes for the gospel to advance. It's a life of being content. The life of being content. Whatever God allows is what we need. So let's not let our circumstances affect our contentment. We like to say, I think is it Caleb, they're, they're, slay, they're saying their slogan, God is good all the time. Right? Anybody say that? Y'all like to say that? Let's live that way. Right? Because it's hard to say that whenever things aren't going well, isn't it? When you're laying in a hospital bed getting infused, right, because you got cancer. Right? If we're going to say God's good all the time, we need to live that way. Christ exalting contentment means that we live that way, no matter what happens. And then finally, we get to our main verse. Verse 13, Christ exalting contentment sets us free from worry. That's what it's all about. That's why I said if you get a hold of this truth today, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Christ exalting contentment sets us free from worry. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So does, does Paul really mean that he can do all things? Is that really what he means? You know, the, the, the greater context, and, and, and you know, if, you, if you want to take it out of context, you'll say, sure, that's exactly what he means. And a professor of mine at seminary, when we were working through this passage, he pointed out, he says, well, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you leap over a building in a single bound? Apparently not. Can you run faster than a steaming locomotive? Apparently not. So apparently we can't do all things, right? We are limited. And Paul was a great example there, right? Just read your Bible. Paul couldn't prevent himself from being beaten repeatedly. Paul couldn't prevent himself from being shipwrecked. Paul couldn't prevent himself from being bit by a snake. And Paul couldn't prevent himself from being arrested in prison, being in prison repeatedly, Right? And he also had some affliction that, that was, he called a thorn in his flesh that caused him much trouble in 2 Corinthians. Right? 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 8 through 10 said, Concerning this thing, this thing, don't we all have this thing? Everybody has this thing. God, God gives each one of us this thing to keep us humble and to lean on him. Considering, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. There most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I, speak, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Man, can you say that this morning? 
Is that your mindset? Have you understood that? Have you grown to understand that all the, in all these things that God is strong, that he is mighty? He is our refuge. He is our strong tower. Looking back at the rest of our passage, Paul is painting a, 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 a different picture, a life that was content in whatever state. He talked about being rich or poor, being well-fed or starving, being free or imprisoned. This verse, the main thing, the focus is on Christ's strength and not on Paul's strength. That's what he's talking about here. It's about Christ's strength, Christ's provision. Right? Because we're not invincible. We're just humans. We're not immortals. Right? We're limited by our humanity. We, we need the base of, of life to survive. We need food, water, and shelter. God knows this. And God has promised us to, to provide these things when our priorities are straight. And that's what it comes back to again. A lot of our contentment issues is priorities. Our priorities get out of whack. That's where our contentment gets out of whack. Look at Matthew 6. This is also a, a popular verse, a well-known verse that we need to have somewhere we, we can be re- reminded of it daily and on the fridge or on the mirror in the restroom or whatever. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. What was Jesus saying? Jesus saying, stop worrying. Stop your worrying and be content. Trust in God's goodness. Trust in God's provision. Right? God will provide for us in the manner in which he sees fit. That's what it comes down to, in the way he sees fit. You, you know, God will provide. He has provided. Amen? Every one of us can say that. None of us in this room can say that God hasn't provided for our needs. Right? The, the essentials of life. And as many have said, he does. He gives us a lot of our wants as, as well. Amen? Along the way. He's a good father. He loves us. So when we are content, we are free to follow Jesus without worrying about our circumstances. Right? We will trust that God will always provide what is needed. What a great place to be. So don't let your circumstances drive your contentment. God knows what you need. He loves you. So in closing this morning, I just want you to remind you of a, a few things. Nothing, nothing, nothing exalts Christ more than when his people are content with his provision. Right? I think the flip side is converse when we're all grumbling and complaining. Right? Nothing brings dishonor to him more than when we complain that we're not content with what he's given us. So through our passage this morning, we see three things. Remembering God's faithfulness leads to contentment. Remembering God's faithfulness leads to contentment. Remember what God has done through your personal life and through your personal experience, but also through God's word, knowing what God's word says. Also, our circumstances don't affect our, content, our contentment. Let's not be fair-weathered followers, right? Rain or storm. Rich or poor, we love the Lord, we follow the Lord. Let's not let our circumstances dictate those things and change our state of contentment. And then lastly, as we just covered, our contentment sets us free from worry. Right? God is going to provide. He's going to come through. He always does. So back to our, our boy, Tim Tebow. Right? He had the wrong understanding of Philippians 4.13. He had the wrong understanding. I'm glad he brought it up. I'm glad. I hope, I hope as many people looked up Philippians 4.13 as they did John 3.16 because Philippians 4.13 it's not about our, us being strong it's about what Christ does it's about what Christ does it's about Christ's strength it's about Christ's faithfulness and if we can get this down pat if we can become content in Christ we can endure whatever circumstances that life sends our way through Christ his strength and his provision Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. The Bible calls us his bride, right? We are the bride of Christ, the church united. And my, my niece was married last night, and I thought about this thing. When you hear the, the pastor say, for richer or poor in sickness and in health, that's contentment. God views us the same way. In sickness and health, richer or poor, we love him the same. It doesn't change based off of what comes along. It's always the same. So let's live this morning with Christ's exalting contentment. Let's resolve to be content. 
with what the Lord has done for us. Let's pray, and we'll have a, a moment of response. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you for this passage, God, that we can read Paul's letter to the Philippians. And, and Father, it's, this is true for us today, God. Forgive us where we, we're so uh, not content with the life that we have, Father. The, the areas where we should be content we aren't. And, and, the, and the opposite, is, it is true, Father, that uh, we grow content in our, our walk with you. And we grow content in our, our uh, understanding of God's word. And we, we grow content in uh, so many areas, Father. Forgive us for those things. But Lord, help us to be content with the life that you've given us, Father, that, that you've moved us. To, to this community for a purpose, that you've put us in uh, jobs for a, a certain purpose. You've placed our young people in schools and raised up teachers in the school system, Father, to, for a purpose. And so, Lord, help us to be content with what you've done for us, Lord. Thank you so much. And, Father, most of all, let us rest and, and be content with that great love that you displayed for us on the cross, Father, where you gave your son uh, to atone for our sins, Father, on our behalf, Lord, that uh, salvation came through his shed blood so father that whoever would call on his name would be saved so father this morning in this time as we close i pray that that your spirit would move among us father that you would bring about conviction where uh we're not content as we should be father but for those that are here in this this closing time that uh, they're not content because they don't have the ability to be content father they don't know you father they don't have the spirit of god so father this morning I pray that you would do a work in their heart as well. Lord, thank you again for this day. Thank you most of all for your son. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.